Ladies and gentlemen, AMD's Vcache technology has been pretty much a cheat code for performance, particularly for gaming workloads when compared to Intel. The 9950X3D as well as the 9800X3D are pretty insane, but it's absolutely nothing compared to the rumors that we're seeing for Zen 6, with up to 240 megabytes of L3 cache for a 12-core variant, at least according to a rumor that's been swirling around over the past couple of days. I want to discuss this, plus some updates regarding the clock frequency and IPC in general, plus also a few tidbits regarding RDNA 5, and we're going to get into all of that, plus more, after this quick message from their sponsor of the video. This video is sponsored by Obspot and the Tiny SE web camera. If you've been following the channel for the last month or two, you'll know that the camera quality on the channel got an absolutely massive upgrade when we switched to the Tiny 2 Lite, which is a 4K AI-driven camera and really has been the backbone of YouTube production. Now, the Tiny SE is very similar to the Tiny 2 Lite. The difference is this is 1080p, but still does retain the 4x digital zoom. It still has the two-axis gimbal and still excellent in low-light conditions. This means that you can actually capture at 1080p at 100 frames a second or 720p 120 frames per second. Plus it has all of the AI tracking, autofocus and white balance and all of the other cool stuff that the Tiny 2 Lite has that I've been using on the channel for the last month or so. The Obspot Tiny SE will work without installation of any other software. You can simply use OBS or what have you to capture. But if you do choose to install the control center, you gain additional features and functionality. Under the console settings, you can adjust the gimbal and mess around with that, as well as uh, adjust the parameters for AI tracking. I'll show you more about how that works in just a moment, but it's very handy if you're doing presentations or unboxing or maybe recording fitness videos or what have you. Under the image settings, meanwhile, auto for just about everything has been excellent for me. And then obviously, because I'm recording primarily for YouTube, I can pull that into Adobe Premiere and do any fine grain adjustments. With that said, maybe for your live streaming with, let's say, green in the background, colored lighting and what have you, especially in a dimmer environment, you may want to mess around with things a little bit. Or if you're doing product unboxings as well, and you want to focus perhaps on one specific thing rather than, uh, let's say, yourself, that could be also helpful. Under the beauty options, I'll be honest, guys, this is a little bit outside of my forte. However, I think there could be some cool things here. For example, you can mess around under the makeup options and give yourself like different colored eyes, which is kind of cool, I guess. Uh, and also under the blur functionality, um, I actually don't usually enable this. I use NVIDIA Broadcast and then put a green screen in the background. As you can see, there's one in the background there along with my shelf of all of my uh, various bits of computer hardware. That needs to be cleared up, but whatever. And uh, yeah, but uh, it is still there. And I know that the blur feature is something that a lot of streamers will use. With that said, there are also a ton of other options that you can mess around with the face and body and makeup. But... I'm going to be honest with you, I, I, I don't think this uh, quite works for me. I don't, I don't think that's uh, quite the look I can pull off. Like the Obspot Tiny 2 Lite, the SE is on a two-axis gimbal that's capable of tracking you around the room by moving either side to side or up and down, as well as zooming in and out. This is brilliant for filming unboxings, presentations, or even something like a cooking video or stuff with larger groups. You can adjust how the tracking modes will function and also have the camera track your hands or even a pointer. This would be excellent if you were to film, let's say, a lecture for YouTube. It's also super easy and intuitive to set up. Just a few clicks and you're done. So guys, thanks very much for watching the ad and also thanks very much to Obspot for sponsoring the video. You can, of course, learn a lot more about the the Obspot Tiny 2 Lite as well as the SE by clicking the links in the video description or in the pinned comment. Thanks again to Obspot for sponsoring the video and now let's just get back into it.
Now, it is widely accepted at this point that AMD will be increasing the core count for the next generation of Ryzen processors. For those of you who haven't been keeping up, I'll just give you a TLDR. There are a plethora of changes for the next generation of Ryzen. The IOD and basically the various interconnects of the chip are going to be changing significantly, but AMD will also be responded to Intel, allegedly, increasing their own core counts as well. So AMD are going to go from uh, 8 core CCD all the way up to 12 core CCDs so of course this means 24 cores 48 threads total I'm skipping out on a lot of technical details here but we've discussed this on the channel several times before so I just want to get everyone up to speed but there is a really interesting rumor that's popped up from Moore's Law is dead I'm going to put my glasses on because my eyesight sucks ass. Based on our AMD recent testing, we expect Final Silicon to have a 6-8% to higher FP IPC versus Zen 5. Note, this is not the final claimed IPC that we'll be taking into account gaming and other performance uplifts. Oh, and I confirm that the 96 megabytes of cache per vCache layer and your prior leak stating that Zen 6 can stack multiple layers is correct. Like your other sources, I have no proof AMD will be going with a too high X3D to consumers, but I can say that it is technically possible for a 12 core 240 megabyte L3 Zen 6 gaming chip to exist. End quote. Now, basically speaking, because the number of cores is going to be increasing, correspondingly, AMD will need to increase the L3 cache. So obviously, this means 48 megabytes, for example, per CCD, but let's just keep things really focused and talk about one CCD for this video. So the 32 megabytes of L3 cache will, of course, become, well, 48 megabytes. And also, Again, if this rumor is true, we'll also see the vCache increase as well because obviously it just simply needs to feed more cores. Now, personally speaking, I haven't heard of a too high configuration for this. I'm going to reach out to some sources to try to find more information. But I wouldn't be surprised if at the very least AMD are testing this internally because you've got to remember that just like... Basically these companies do stuff all of the time and sometimes it's never actually for the intention of releasing it it's just buggering around figuring out hey how does this scale what can we learn and so on and so on and obviously the problem is with something like this let's just assume it is accurate for a moment i would be very interested to see one what the cost of this would be especially given well you could just imagine <laughs> just how big the chip would be uh and the second point of course I would also be very curious to see how various workloads scale. So, of course, there are simply diminishing returns. With that said, with game engines becoming increasingly more paralyzed, and this is um, something we're going to be seeing like with the new Unreal Engine, like there's a good reason that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, at the moment, essentially you have one, maybe two threads that are really doing a lot of the work with Unreal Engine 5.4, for example, and this is being changed significantly. Tim Sweeney spoke about this quite at length. I think at the... I'm possibly going to mess this up. I think it was on the Lex Friedman podcast. There was a really interesting section where he was talking about the increase in parallelism for um, Unreal Engine 5.6 and for future. And basically speaking, there's a lot of like, there is a lot of benefit, of course, of increasing this. And quite honestly, I would not be surprised if the rumors are true that Sony will actually be increasing the core counts for the next generation PlayStation and theoretically as well, Microsoft for the Xbox. Now, there's another slide from Tom who says, early testing in our department, AMD is yielding a 13 to 16% 6, uh, performance over Zen 5 at the same clocks in server workloads. But I must stress that this wasn't comprehensive testing. So don't take this as average IPC. Clock speeds are impressive. Even our target voltage is not overclocked. Some of our Zen 6 samples are boosting to nearly 4.5 gigahertz. And in lighter multi-thread workloads, we can often run all cores on a CCD at 4 gigahertz. That's much higher than the final Zen 5C silicon is capable of now, end quote. Now, one of my sources, I'm going to read this verbatim, told me um, clock targets are pretty early this is back a couple of months ago i think it was from february i'm told it was at 1.1 volts that's around a 1.15x performance can be had from the shift of n4 
to N2P, but AMD may target a VMAX reduction, potentially offsetting with extra metal layers. They also add that uh, they wouldn't be surprised if Zen 6 will actually be capable pretty easily of hitting over 6 gigahertz for lightly multi-threaded workloads. Uh, Tom is actually saying, according to what he's been speculating with his sources, that it could be significantly higher than that. Quite honestly, with this stuff, I'll just wait and see. Like, I think it's a little early at this point. Don't forget, these chips are not launching this year, so I think we're going to have a much better understanding of where the final clock frequencies lie. I will be a very interested, though, to see what this actually is capable of. At the end of the day, I think AMD are going to be facing a lot of pressure from Intel. I'm honestly hearing things completely differently from different people. <laughs> like, it's quite interesting because some of my Intel sources are like, Intel are going to win. Intel are definitely going to win. And then my AMD sources or people who just like AMD are like, no, AMD are going to win. I'll leave it for you guys to decide whether Nova Lake or Zen is going to, uh, sorry, uh, Zen 6 or uh, Nova Lake is going to be like the faster. It's, I'll be very curious because I've got to tell you guys, like, and this is like a very like simplistic take. If AMD wins in multi thread <laughs> when, when Intel has like 52 cores, Yes, I know some of them are low power, but let's just be, you know, simple about this. That's not a good look. <laughs> that would be really bad. That would be pretty bad. Um, I I'll just let you know what. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. It's, it's over. <laughs> just, just tap out. Just tap out Intel. It's fine. <laughs> you had a good run. You had the Pentium 2. You're good. You've had the memories. It's fine. It's fine. Just, just, just tap. Throw in the damn towel. Um, but yeah, I'll be very interested to see how the next generation of Zen uh, actually fares. And the other thing as well, and I, I, I keep going back to this. The longevity of the AM platforms has been a massive positive for AMD. Because yeah, I know, obviously you're going to get like the new motherboards, they're going to have all these new features, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, just having that that forwards and backwards compatibility and i don't necessarily mean i'll be interested actually to hear what you guys think in the comments but i don't think it actually is necessarily so good for or benefits should i say the highest end users like the ones who go from like the you know the, the flagship processes every generation but for those who were doing like mid-range upgrades, so for example, if you had like a, a 3600X and then you went to like, you know, a six or an eight core um, Zen 3, for example, I think that could be ben very beneficial because obviously it brings the cost of the platform upgrades down significantly. But with Intel, it's like, oh, you, you, you changed one tiny thing. Well, time for a new socket. The rumor is, of course, that there will be a new Intel um, Arrow Lake refresh coming out, but it doesn't look like there's going to be anything significant here. It basically seems like it's the same thing, just slightly higher clocks, frequencies with a better NPU, which is quite interesting given the position of the NPU on the chip. I wonder if they're going to change anything else. From what I'm hearing, the answer is no, but I'd be very interested to see whether they do change any of the the various frequencies to see if there's any increases there but i haven't heard anything specific also one other small tip bit and this is really early but one source has told me at this point that they are hearing the rdna 5 or whatever it ends up bloody being called for gaming at this point amd are considering making a monolithic die so just to be clear we are referring here to the compute dies so basically speaking it's not going to have like multiple gcds or whatever the hell they're going to be calling it it's going to be just a single one which is quite interesting because that's actually conflicting to the previous rumors that i've been hearing so i don't know if amd are making a a big change in the decision or whether the multiple dies and this could this could certainly be the case or whether the multiple dies that we've been hearing for rdna5 again whatever it ends up being called those are going to be for professional usage i'll be very interested to see what happens there with that said guys take care of yourselves have an amazing day bye for now